welcome to the Alex Gem Experience. This podcast is going to be exceptional. Let's dive straight in. So this podcast is essentially about the brain. How does it work? What is it comprised of? How does a strong brain affect your life? What enables the brain to function even better? And what ruins the brain's ability to function optimally? These will all be uncovered in today's podcast. So firstly, what even is the brain? Well, quite frankly and honestly, the brain is the most complex and powerful tool slash organ in the universe. That's right. And you're about to find out why that is. So firstly, we must understand that, you know, the the brain is extremely powerful. It consists of over 100 billion neurons and trillions of connections that we call synapses, what essentially links neurons to one another, allowing transmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline to uh, transfer from one, well, the axon within a nerve the end part, the tail end, if you will, of a neuron um, and enabling it to attach to, um, well, dendrites, which is, you know, near the top of the um, neuron. So now that we know that and we'll uncover ways of enabling your brain to make more connections between these neurons um, and now enabling it to come up with new thoughts, new beliefs over time through neuroplasticity, which enables the brain to uh, essentially rewire and restructure itself. Um, I mean, the brain has the ability to cure, to create and cure diseases, okay? Based on how it functions, your limiting beliefs, the chemicals that your beliefs create, which we call uh, feelings, emotions, which affect the actions that we do. And this, over time can result in massive inflammation, chronic stress, chronic fatigue, um, all kinds of ailments, impairments, diseases, and long-term mental issues such as dementia and so on on and so forth. So the brain is crucial, and this is why we must look after our brains, and we'll uncover how we can do so. So what is even a neuron? Pretty much neurons are units of the brain and within the nervous system. They're responsible for like receiving sensory input from external elements. It's responsible for sending commands to our muscles, enabling us to move or not move for that instant. Um, and it transforms and relays electrical signals throughout the body, causing us to think certain things, feel certain emotions, uh, based upon how our limbic brain responds, and we'll look at that in a bit more detail later. Um, So let's dive straight in. What is the brain actually comprised of? Well, the brain is made of of many specialised areas, okay? And they don't necessarily work in isolation. They do work together, uh, which is why we are able to essentially think so much more deeply and analytically and brilliantly in comparison to other mammals and so on. So firstly, let's start with the cortex, the outer layer of the brain, the newest part of the brain, if you will. It doesn't fully develop until we are about 25 years old. And it's the most complex part of the brain. It's essentially the CEO. Your cortex is responsible for your most detailed, nuanced thinking it's where your brain sequences things. It's when you plan. It's, your, it's responsible for large part of your creative side. It's responsible for your logic, your rational thinking, your ability to think of facts and, and statistics and so on and so forth as well. Um, whenever you analyze or you, when you evaluate things, when you place judgment, your cortex is the one who is That is running the show, essentially. We also have what's called the brain stem. This runs between the spinal cord and the rest of the brain. It 
helps us with more like um, basic functions such as breathing, sleeping and so on and so forth. Now, the brain is divided into many different lobes as well, okay? So, um, we have the frontal lobes, which are responsible for problem solving, judgment and so on and so forth, like I outlined previously. We also have what's called parietal lobe, and this manages sensations, uh, enables us to judge how things feel when we physically touch things as well. I believe it also has a role in balance, in, in noticing where we are in space. Um, so whenever you need to do any like backwards or sideways movement, it's calculating distance and so on and so forth. We also have the temporal lobe. Temporal lobes involved with memory and hearing, language acquisition, uh, formulating language and so on and so forth. And we have uh, at the back of the brain, the occipital lobe which is all about our visual processing, what we see through our eyes and the brain responds appropriately to that information, okay? So all these parts of the brain, they have their certain specialised abilities, but they also work congruently to enable us to make the best course of action for ourselves. Now, there are also three different layers within the brain, if you will. I spoke about the, I alluded to this earlier. So we've got the reptilian brain, which is the most ancient part within our brain. It's no different to a lizard's brain, okay? Its primary functions are for uh, reproduction and for survival purposes. So essentially, basic needs are governed by the reptilian brain. When the reptilian brain is switched on, it cannot be defeated, okay? Doesn't matter how wise we are, how intelligent we are, that when the reptilian brain has been triggered, it takes precedence, okay? Because the reptilian brain is all about keeping us alive. Not happy, but alive. Over time, we have developed what's called the emotional brain, the limbic system. The limbic brain, it's comprised of all sorts of things. The hypothalamus, the hippocampus, which is where we create new neurons every single day. We produce about 700 new neurons in the brain, in the, in the limbic system, the hippocampus. And when we learn new things and when we are challenged appropriately, that can actually double and we can actually become more and more intelligent. And actually the hippocampus actually grows in, in, and expands physically uh, when it's being used. So we've got things like the amygdala as well, which is responsible for dealing with life-threatening things. It can be very excitable very quickly. So, for instance, where if you hear a... Sorry about this. But if you hear a thud and you didn't know what it was and you were startled, your amygdala responds first. It is the quickest to respond, okay? It's here to keep us alive. Now, afterwards, once you hear a thud... And you have that kind of, your your mind kind of freaks out for a moment. After that moment, that's when the cortex begins to intervene. And the cortex then begins to take into account different pieces of information. Okay? So it starts to think, oh, it was a bang, someone dropped something. Or it was uh, maybe a car made a large noise, it's nothing serious. And then your brain start. you might think certain thoughts such as, you can calm down now, it's okay, it's not life-threatening, you can chill out, it was something silly or um, unexpected, it's unimportant. And that's how you calm the reptilian brain down, the amygdala and so on and so forth as well, the limbic brain. So... The key is as well, what I want to talk about, because I have the potential to forget some of these things later on. The reptilian brain triggers the limbic brain, the emotions, deep emotions within us. Our intuition also resides in the limbic brain. Sometimes when we can feel certain things and we're not sure why we feel certain ways. Have you ever met someone before and you're like, I don't know why, but I just don't trust this person. That's your limbic brain. It gathers all kinds of information throughout your past and it's responsible for determining your emotions and how you judge things. Okay? Um, So it's very, very crucial. It's essential, but it can be misleading as well. Um, So the limbic brain, the emotional part of the brain, is really important. Now, this kind of goes hand in hand with our reptilian brain. So if something happens and it freaks us out, 
the reptilian brain and the limbic brain are startled, they set off, they are activated, okay? Now, when this happens, we want to take charge if it's not an uh, immediate emergency. So we're going to want our cortex, our CEO, to get back involved, to take charge of the situation, to calm us down and to take the best course of action. Because when we are fearful, right, we don't access information the best way. We don't make the best decisions because we are acting out of fear and therefore can be quite irrational depending on the situation, right? So if we want to take control again, we might want to utilize deep breathing. Inhale deeply for several seconds, hold your breath for several seconds and then breathe out very slowly as though you are blowing through a straw, okay? Now, as a general rule of thumb, and you can work your way up, you might want to inhale for about four seconds, hold your breath for about six seconds and then exhale for about eight seconds. Now, you can increase this over time when you get more comfortable with doing so. But when you do this, what happens is it enables blood to flow to your left prefrontal cortex. This calms your circuits down so you don't hyperventilate, you know, exaggerate your responses, your reactions. And it enables your your cortex to take back control and to react um, appropriately to a certain situation. That's what we want. So there's a little strategy for you there. So we now know the three parts within the brain. The reptilian brain, the ancient, most archaic part. We've got the limbic brain, the emotional brain. And we have the cortex. So let's dive straight in. What enables our brains to function better? Actually, before we look at that. I do want us to understand the significance of having a brain that works effectively, optimally at its best. When your brain functions well, you are able to make better decisions more often. Now, when you make better decisions more often, you essentially start to think more long term. You start to make better decisions for your longevity, for productivity, for efficiency reasons. You think far more coherently, greater clarity, you don't get involved in negative addictions, you have more control of your life, when you have more control of your life, you become more disciplined, when you become more disciplined, you increase and develop your self-esteem, when you improve your self-esteem, you start to attract and move toward better quality things, you improve the quality of your life, you begin to feel happier, more exhilarated and captivated in your life, you serve people more, You're more appreciated by other people and you just have a more fulfilling lifestyle. Now, when your brain functions optimally, you also naturally make better choices for your health. When you make better choices for your health, you are less likely to incur all kinds of illnesses and diseases and any subsequent um, brain related problems. Okay. So now that we understand that your brain and the way your brain functions is really responsible for everything, we can now move on. Because, you know, when your brain is compromised, when it's not working well, not only are you less productive, but you make much more impulsive decisions. You lack control. This can result in all kinds of emotional disorders, sleep disorders, relationship problems, living in isolation, Um, becoming depressed, living in anxiety, lacking trust, and so on and so forth. So now that we understand how important looking after the brain really is, let's dive into what enables the brain to function better. Well, firstly, you're going to want to, let's look at some supplements here. You are going to want to supplement with DHA, okay? Okay. Now, when you consume things like krill oils and fish oils, you give your body omega-3 fatty acids. Now, what we have to understand is that our brains 
are comprised of 60% fat. That's right. Our brain is essentially made up of lots of different chemicals, but predominantly water and fat. Okay. Now, our cerebral cortex, the last layer within the brain, the, the newest, more modern part of the brain, if you will, is made up of 15 to 20% fat, DHA. Okay. So the best thing you could possibly do for your brain is to consume things like seafood, wild caught salmon, uh, most fish in general as well is useful, but especially omega-3, okay? You don't want to overdo omega-6. Omega-3 is much better for cognitive function and to for your brain to work more sharply, more effectively, and more quickly, to be honest. So that's step number one. Something else that has been proven over time is by following a ketogenic diet, okay? So there are all so many things that support um, creating ketones. Uh, intermittent fasting plays a role. Eating, uh, you know, 90% um, fats, especially healthy fats, will be ideal. So things like avocados, coconut oil, olive oils, um, egg yolk, um, all sorts of healthy fats like your, your lean meats, your fish, and so on and so forth are great fats um, to support a ketogenic diet. Now, you have to have really low carbs in order to stay keto and a moderate amount of protein. Okay, so now that we know some of the basics, and obviously it's more complicated than that, but this is not the keto show. Um, it teaches your brain to utilize ketones rather than glucose. So when you have a normally like a, a diet high in carbohydrates and low in fats and so on and so forth, your brain functions by utilizing glucose as a means of needing energy. Now, your brain requires so much energy to function. Interestingly as well, I thought I'd just share this with you for now, your brain actually becomes more active when you sleep. So at night time, or whenever you sleep for that matter, your brain comes alive even more so. And we'll get back to that later. But we must understand that our brains um, need the right kind of nutrients in order to thrive and to function optimally. So a ketogenic diet can also help with brain function. Now, you can also stimulate what's called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factors. Now, let me quickly outline why you want to stimulate and activate this within your brain. When you stimulate and activate BDNF, firstly, it enables the neurons within your brain to make more and more connections. When you do that, you are able to perceive anew, become more open-minded, come up with newer, stronger, more supportive thoughts, uh, neural connections and beliefs over time, okay? You just have more options if you want to see it that way. Not only does it provide us with more options to connect neurons to different neurons, it also strengthens and consolidates our synapses, so I said this earlier, synapses connect neurons to one another. Now, when this is strengthened, your thoughts become clearer, more vivid, and it enables you to respond better to your thoughts in the form of stimulating emotions and doing the actions that best support those beliefs and thoughts. So stimulating BDNF increases the connections within your neurons, between your neurons. Um, it also strengthens the connections between these neurons in, in the form of the synapses. And it also makes you more open-minded because BDNF, it kind of takes you back in a way. What do I mean by that? Well, it takes you back to having more of a childlike mentality. Like, you know how children are more able to perceive new things and learn rapidly and so on and so forth. It gives you that kind of sponge-like brain. Well, that's what happens when you stimulate BDNF within your brain, to be honest. So we want to also be able to stimulate that so that we can think better 
be able to change our lives, the course of our lives, being able to focus on new things, learn new things more easily, absorb it within our long-term memory better, and so on and so forth. So we are able to learn better, we are able to have more energy, we are able to change the course of our lives by stimulating BDNF. Now, now that you know why we want to do this, there are so many different things we can do to stimulate BDNF. Essentially, in terms of food, you want to give your brain glutamate. Yes, the hormone and neurotransmitter glutamate. Uh, we will want to stimulate. So we can either have this in the form of a, a tablet, a capsule, or we can... Uh, consume it naturally in foods and think of your traditional omelets so things like mushrooms tomatoes cheese soy milk eggs and so on and so forth these foods are tremendous in terms of giving us the glutamate needed to stimulate and activate bdnf interestingly also rich scenery so when you look at like mountains volcanoes when you're by the beach really stimulating um powerful um, visuals will certainly stimulate BDNF. Also, alternating exposure to the hot and the cold are brilliant for activating BDNF. So, for instance, having freezing cold water splashed on your head and body for 30 seconds, then taking it to quite hot, then going back to freezing cold, then back to hot and so on and so forth. It's firstly, it's brilliant for circulation and your immunity, but it's also brilliant for stimulating BDNF as well. It's, it's very, it's the shock factor that really does this, okay? So there are so many different things we can do to stimulate BDNF. Again, it's not that kind of podcast. I'll delve in, I have delved in deeper in other videos, um, and, you know, just do your own research as well for that matter. But there are tons of things we can do in terms of what we eat, how we can visualize, how to stimulate BDNF. Um, keto can stimulate BDNF. Uh, intermittent fasting stimulates BDNF. Um, so many diverse things. Exercise stimulates BDNF. Especially HIIT training. Sleeping well stimulates BDNF. Right, let's move on. Enough of BDNF. <laughs> but along the same vein is my next point. And really, it's the importance of mental stimulation. Bear with me for a minute. So when we stimulate the brain, and by that, I'm really referring to neurogenesis. Okay, when the brain is appropriately challenged... Not overloaded. Remember, that most people can't um, take on board or access more than seven different pieces of information. I believe it can extend to nine for some people. But hey, let's keep it at seven for now. So when you, we, we want, we want, firstly, we want to avoid cognitive overwhelm and overload. But at the same time, we also want to stimulate the brain. So when we learn new things... Such as, you know, listening to this podcast, if you didn't know some of these things and you're learning new things, I'm actually enabling your brain to function better. That's right. You're welcome. Now, when you learn new things, such as from reading a book or watching a video or listening to a podcast and so on and so forth, you stimulate neurogenesis. Like I said earlier, it enables the neurons, new neurons within your brain to even double really is wonderful stuff i believe to 2400 it can double up to that's incredible in terms of the amount of new neurons you can produce in a, a single day really tremendous stuff so we want to consistently learn new things and that's one of the ways ways in which you can also prevent um age related diseases such as uh, dementia and so on constantly keeping physically active but also mentally active Partaking in crosswords, learning the directions from one place to another, learning new things, playing chess and so on and so forth. Keeping yourself active, playing cards, learning new things, um, partaking in games that stimulate brain function are great ways to stimulate neurogenesis, to keep us sharp, focused and to prevent 
all kinds of problems um, developing in one's brain, uh, preventing all kinds of decay within the brain over time. All kinds of plaque. It prevents plaque from building within the brain over time because plaque is what leads to age-related diseases. And I'll come back to this later, but sleeping well, uh, quality and good quantity sleep um, definitely prevents you from developing age re- or delays at least symptoms of age related problems and ailments so let's carry on physical exercise yes now physical exercise is not just great for producing releasing endorphins making us less stressed improving our blood circulation making us let out toxins and so on and so forth in, in, in our pores when we sweat and so on. But it's also now proven to make us more intelligent. That's right. Exercise can actually stimulate neurogenesis. Exercise can make you smarter. In fact, not only does consistent exercise over time make you smarter and increase your metabolism for that matter, but it also you actually become sm- you're at your peak in terms of intelligence, sharpness, being really acute and aware of things, astute, should I say, um, for the next two to three hours after you've exercised. That's right. So if you want to be at your best for a meeting or um, an activity where you need to be sharp and focused, doing working on a project, exercising beforehand is the perfect way to get your brain working at its best. Um, There are all sorts of, I'll I'll just retract slightly, there are all sorts of supplements that you can take to make your brain function better, like 5-HTP, tyrosine, uh, L-DOPA, all sorts of different things you can consume to make your brain function better. You know, um, Onit, a brand, uh, produces something called Alpha Brain, which is great for brain function as well. It has natural ingredients to stimulate the the functioning of the brain. So if you are interested in those things, go check that out. Um, MCT oil, uh, just a, an element, an ingredient within coconut oil. It's extracted from coconut oil in its purest form. And it's uh, very potent for increasing your energy levels, but also making you your brain function better. Great for keto as well. Mm. Speaking of supplements, next, obviously... You want to take on board our nutrition, all right? So predominantly, we want to eat mostly whole earth-grown foods, okay? So nuts, seeds, legumes, um, eggs, um, celery, spinach, kale, tomatoes, mushrooms, all kinds of vegetables, salads, all kinds of nuts, unless you're allergic. Nuts are incredible for brain function, especially walnuts. I believe um, cashews are supportive. Almonds are great as well. Uh, they're probably the best nuts to uh, support a ketogenic lifestyle and to give your brain the ketones it needs to really thrive and work at its best are macadamia nuts. So definitely invest in macadamia nuts. Uh, but mostly nuts and seeds in general are great. Like um, sunflower seeds are fantastic. Uh, pumpkin seeds are great. Lot, very high in vitamin E. Very good for brain function as well. Speaking of brain function, things like blueberries are one of the best things you can consume for your brain as well. Uh, but mostly all, all kinds of berries actually do wonders. Like strawberries, raspberries, they're all good. Um, so whole earth grown foods are the way to go. It improves your blood sugar, prevents you from gain, from getting type 2 but diabetes. And, you know, diabetes, along with other kinds of um, diseases, um, also lead to mental health problems such as dementia. Um, so bear that in mind. So your nutrition is absolutely crucial. Your, your nutrition can reduce the amount of stress you endure. Uh, And later on, I'll tell you why you want to reduce stress in your life. So nutrition is key. Exercise consistently. You know, high intensity training is best for stimulating BDNF. Um, 
for helping you burn fat. The more fat you have, the body fat I'm talking about, it can make you more sl- sluggish, more lethargic. Um, it can make you a bit foggy and lazier in terms of your mental output and so on. And, and vice versa. I mean, overtraining can actually uh, ruin and harm your neurons as well. Like If you are someone who is a gym rat and you're not giving yourself the right kind of nutrients... Like you can overdo training, you can overdo focusing on your on aesthetics and your physical appearance too much, uh, and therefore uh, inhibiting your brain development, your brain growth. Just briefly as well, like I said, I have the potential to forget to say these sort of things. But I mean, one of the reasons why you want to avoid things like alcohol and illicit drugs, especially at a young age, is because if you have all kinds of bad habits when you're in your when you're an adolescent when you're a young adult as well you can actually prevent your cortex your frontal cortex um you know what we spoke about being incredibly important to making the best choices for your life becoming a more intelligent person becoming happy and so on it can actually reduce and limit how much your brain can physically grow and therefore also um how intelligent you can become so you can do permanent damage to your brain by partaking all kinds of drugs, excessive use of alcohol, eating awful foods consistently, um, suffering in terms of sleep quality and so on and so forth. But I'll come back to this in a bit. So you're going to want to eat well. You also want to, you will want to keep hydrated. Let's put it this way. I mean, just so you know as well, I'm going to change the focus slightly, but I promise you it's related. If you look at the people who actually died in physical combat, such as um, boxing or martial arts, people who have actually died in the ring, it happened at lower weight divisions. And one of the reasons why it happened in these lower weight divisions is because athletes tend to massively dehydrate themselves so that they can get into certain weight brackets and fight smaller individuals but the problem is that when you're when you get hit not this not necessarily uh, like to the head a headshot um even to the body it can can be quite concussive as well think about you know american football and so on or rugby as well um you can actually get concussed by taking a blow to the body like being drilled through and, you know, slammed to the floor. Uh, But anyways, when you get... Sorry, so these fighters, these athletes who died in the ring, it happened because they were significantly dehydrated. And what happens is when you take some kind of physical damage or a blow to the head, the head kind of shakes and recoils within within the skull, right? And if you don't have that layer of protection because of that water protection, right, what happens is it won't recoil and it will just be a shocking thud and you can make permanent damage to the brain and actually die uh, because you were dehydrated. So the point, uh, the reason why I wanted to share these facts with you are because hydration is key. Now, don't get me wrong. Um... There is a time and a place for dehydrating oneself. And I do it as well because it's fantastic for cell rejuvenation. Because, you know, oh God, you're getting me involved in this now. But it's important, so I'll quickly do it. When you are doing intermittent fasting, which is great for keto, for great for fat loss, great for losing body fat, um, having more energy in the long term and so on and so forth. Even though that's really effective, what you might want to do, say, once a month is what we call a dry fast. Okay, so different religions, especially Islam, they they go through, you know, a time once a year for a month. They will abstain from uh, water and food for extended periods of time. Now, you don't have to take it to that extremity, but you will want to do a dry fast for about 16 hours or more, ideally once a month. Because when you do this, um, you actually force your body. And and interestingly enough, you still need to go pee quite a bit 
And you're thinking, why am I still peeing? I haven't drunk anything, for, had no fluids. Or there's been no, like, um, I haven't washed or showered and, and no water's been absorbed through my through the pores within my skin as well. Like, there's been no fluid going in me yet. I'm still going to the toilet. Now, when you go to the toilet, when you go for a pee in someone, when one you've been doing your dry fasting, you actually pee out dead cells, impure cells, impure and, and unhelpful dying cells and free radicals, which is absolutely brilliant because essentially you get to keep your best cells and kind of eliminate cells that have been compromised within your body that's still been locked and, and still working within your body but they aren't strong they aren't potent so every now and then you will want to utilize a dry fast but generally speaking we want to be massively hydrated all right i believe the average is at least eight glasses large glasses of water um per day i forget the exact dosage i want to say a gallon at least a gallon a day um it's a lot of water i know it's great when you wake up and you have a, a huge glass of water to begin your day. Really gets the brain working. Really gets you, makes you want to move around more and so on and so forth. Enables you to wake up more quickly. So, yeah, let's move on because otherwise I could talk about this all day as well. And it's not that kind of podcast. But keeping hydrated is wonderful for your brain function. And I can really lay testament to this because when, sometimes when I do my dry fast, after about 12 to 14 hours, I actually start to develop a bit of a headache. And this shows you just how much your brain wants water. It wants to keep hydrated. It wants that fluid within the brain and so on and so forth. So hydration is pertinent and necessary for improving brain function. So get used to drinking a lot of water most days and every now and then you're going to want to shock the system by utilizing a dry fast let's move on so we definitely want to improve our blood pressure now what happens i mean why do we want to improve our blood pressure well high blood pressure in um especially during you know midlife it actually increases cognitive decline as we continue to age So we want to do everything that we can to reduce your, our blood pressure, right? So things like exercising daily, losing body fat, limit, not too much, of course, though. You know, limiting how much alcohol you have, doing what you can to reduce stress, having the, giving your body the right kind of nutrients it needs, um, sleeping well, all these sorts of things. Essentially living a really healthy lifestyle. Um, really enables your brain to function, to be healthy, to be strong. Um, essentially, look after the heart in the form of exercise, eating well, giving you nutrients, not, not leading to blood clots through eating garbage, unhealthy things consistently, giving your body the right kind of supplements, abstaining from excessive alcohol, drugs, tobacco, you know, smoke and so on and so forth. Um, reducing oxidative stress is what we will want to do. Um, to essentially lower our blood pressure, okay? Now, the next one is key. Mm. We're going to want to practice mindfulness strategies. So meditation is one of the main ones for this. Yoga is great as well. I like to do uh, lots of visualization. Every single day I make time for visualizing my future so I get used to living in the future as opposed to being stuck in the past, haunted or traumatized by um, emotional memories of um, feeling inadequate or, or, or upset or in pain or suffering or uh, unloved and so on. You want to get rid of living in the past when you might have been let down or gone through a difficult experience. And you want to instead visualize what kind of future you want. Because your unconscious can't tell the difference between what's actually happened in real life and also what you vividly imagined. Okay? And when you visualize, you'll want to use a whole host of NLP strategies. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but 
you know, viewing things through your eyes and not from a detached perspective, like a bird's eye point of view. You don't want to see your entire body and face um, when you visualize your life. You want to see it as though you're looking through your eyes um, in the immediate experience. You want to have vivid colors involved, make it nice, bright, zoom in. Don't don't have the image be completely distant. Um, you want the image in your mind to take up the whole of your, your, your visionary field. You don't want to see the image or the, vi- or the video in your mind as though you're looking at it through like a portrait, like a frame. Um, you want to really um, see it as though you would do normally, just why I'm sure your eyes are open right now. That's the kind of way you want to visualize uh, your future through your eyes. Um, you want it to be really vivid, clear, like HD resolution, if you will. Um, you want everything to be very, very optimized, clear. You might want to add some sound effects. Um, you want, you might want to add some action, some motion to the image and turn it into a video clip to make it even more potent and powerful. Uh, these are all brilliant strategies coined by the, uh, the amazing uh, linguists and NLP practitioners, uh, Richard Bandler and John Grinder. So go check out their material. Uh, so meditation is all about focusing on your... There are different types of meditation, to be fair. But especially if you're a beginner, uh, breathing is what you want to focus on. So every time something else comes into your mind, such as, you know, when a colleague made you upset, when you had an argument with a, with a friend or something like that, you want to quickly distract yourself and bring your focus back to your breathing. Just focus on breathing in and slowly breathing out, keeping calm. Meditation enables you to access the alpha brainwave state, which is one of the best states needed for creativity Um it's when your subconscious opens up. It's, it's the best time to really communicate with your own subconscious and rewire and change things within your brain. When we wake up and we're really focused on something, when we hypnotize ourselves, like maybe when we're listening to music or when we're driving or when we're really immersed in a TV show or movie, uh, this is when we are in a trance. That's also when we enter, um, what do you call it? Alpha brainwave state. So that's really key. Um, Delta brainwave state is when you're sleeping. Beta is when you are awake and your critical mind is switched on. Uh, It's when you're thinking so many thoughts per minute. So it's quite hard to um, be creative, to be very thoughtful because you're too busy being judgmental, analytical, feeling analyzed. Your ego is really switched on. You don't want your ego to be switched on when you want to learn new things, when you want to challenge your brain, when you want to rewire your brain uh, and thus over time become better, stronger, happier, healthier and so on and so forth. Um, so not Delta. For some reason, it's, it's escaped my mind. Damn it. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. I can't believe I forgot it. But anyways, the other one is essentially... When you're switching between being... It's kind of like when you're being half asleep and when you're groggy. So when you go... For, sometimes when you go for a shower, right? Um, it takes you into that brainwave state. If that's it. Theta. Damn it. Thank God for that. Theta is when you are kind of switching between being half asleep and being kind of awake. It's when you're having a shower and you're kind of... Kind of groggy as well um i don't know about you but sometimes this is really brilliant for being really innovative creative original because you are thinking so fewer thoughts per minute that you are so relaxed that you are open to be more creative and original and outrageous with your thinking and your imagination so i don't know about you guys but sometimes when i'm like half asleep and i'm dozing off Something will come to my mind. I'm like, oh, my God, what an idea. How creative is that? Some of my best ideas come to me when I'm half asleep. And I force myself to get out of bed. I'm like, oh, I'm tired. Oh, my God. And I get, I put pen to paper or I write something on my phone quickly and save it and capture that brilliant idea. And it becomes one of my gems. No pun intended. Alex, gem. You get it? Sorry about that. But um, so when you are in this theta brainwave state as well, it's really, really beautiful for your creativity. 
So let's move on. Enough is enough of all this. How else can we improve our brain function? Well, we want peace, peace. We want clarity. We do want to meditate. We want to be less likely to partake in negative, addictive behaviors such as uh, too much illicit drugs, too much medication. It will prevent you from being meditating. Will prevent you from being depressed. Um, meditating can make you more in control of what you choose to eat, what what activities you partake in on a daily basis. Meditating will help you sleep better. You're less likely to suffer from depression and um, anxiety disorders and all sorts of problems uh, by meditating daily. So meditation is one of the best things you can do for your brain function to reduce stress, to function with clarity, with precision, with uh, and, and optimally. Okay. Uh, lastly, we'll look at the importance of um, s- like light, to be honest with you, because if you are used to doing things in the dark and mostly seeing the dark, this is why the winter um, winter months can be quite difficult because you're, you wake up and it's dark outside, you go to work probably um, and you're mostly indoors and then by the time you go back home from work, it's dark again. Like this is not only bad for your emotions, making you more likely to be sad and over- melancholic and over time depressed and so on. Um, but it actually affects your brain function as well because your emotions are largely tied to how your brain works, anyways. So when you aren't, when you don't have visual stimulation in terms of brightness and light, um, then you can it can actually inhibit the quality of your brain function. So you want to be in well-lit areas, especially you want natural sources of light, such as sunlight. Vitamin D is actually is incredible for your mood, your hormone function, your brain function, your energy levels, your metabolism, your testosterone levels, and so on and so forth. So light, especially sunlight, um, is brilliant for your brain, your skin, your body, and so on. But also... Along the same vein, natural uh, scenery helps as well. So walking amongst trees, grass, seeing flowers, smelling flowers increases your energy, your focus. Uh, These are all wonderful things to make you more intelligent and so on and so forth, okay? Wow, we've gone in deep. Mm. Lastly, and some of this might be a little bit repetitive, because in many ways it's the uh, complete opposite. But we also need to now look at what ruins our brain's ability to function at its best. So like I said previously, physical brain damage is one of the main ways to lead to imbalances within the brain. And not just that. Um, Brain damage can actually lead to a disconnect between your thoughts and your emotions. That's right. You can become less empathetic as a result of brain damage. You can do all kinds of awful things. You can become more apathetic, more indifferent, less caring, less ambitious. Brain damage uh, messes up your hormone levels. Um, In men, it can make you... um, really really reduce natural testosterone levels um it can make you less ambitious um i would like to tell you the story of the um the famous and now infamous um professional wrestler chris benoit chris benoit was um a tremendous professional wrestler Really old school, brilliant, uh, a great entertainer, really tough, too tough for his own good, I think. Um, you know, professional wrestling is one of the most difficult jobs in the world to do. You're putting your body and your mind, of course, as well, through tremendous amount of pain, pain aches, taking a lot of steroids and, and growth hormone and doing whatever you can to reduce the physical and mental abuse that you're putting yourself through. And Chris Benoit was a very family-oriented man. He was um, an incredible human being, Um, very loving, very giving to his fans, very respectful, honourable, constantly seen, you know, kissing, hugging his wife, his children, his boys. And uh, one day he lost it. 
and um, he ended up uh, firstly uh, murdering his wife. Um, he then murdered his own son, whom he adored, um, and then after shortly after hung himself from gym apparatus. Uh, really famous, uh, devastating story that struck fear and devastation, but also awareness uh, amongst the wrestling community. Um, because most most people's knee jerk reaction to this such, such kind of aggressive, volatile behaviour is automatically and in a way understandably linked to steroids. Right, you take steroids. You become more aggressive, you become less caring, less empathetic, more violent. Yeah, we get this to an extent. It's true. But these kind of behaviours go above that. And when they analysed Chris Benoit's brain, they found that because he, he, his brain, he was only about, I think he was in his 40s. He's like early 40s, I want to say. But they analysed his brain and his brain was so damaged and compromised that they actually said that his brain resembled the, the brain of an 80-year-old man. That's what brain damage can do. He lost his ability to, to, to his brain function. He lost the connections between his emotions and his thoughts. Literally, some parts within his brain was cut off uh, because of the excessive damage. And it is the main reason why he did such cruel, heinous reactions to the people he loved most. So brain damage, that's why it's incredibly important to look after your brain, to take care of your brain. And uh, me personally, I, I adore martial arts. I am a, I would say I'm a, I'm a martial artist. Now, if it wasn't for brain damage, I would like to say, but I would say, you know, I would love to say that I would be a professional athlete in one form or another, especially in boxing or kickboxing predominantly. I absolutely love it. I love the intensity. I love the psychology involved. I love the competitiveness, uh, the focus needed. You cannot switch off for a second. I love the individuality. I love the brilliance involved. I love... Uh, just how hard you have to push yourself when you are doing combat sports. And the, the main reason I didn't pursue it as a career was because of brain damage. Um, it really, there is no substitute for it. You've got all these athletes, especially American football stars, who make millions and millions. And in their, you know, after their careers are over, they end up squandering most, if not all, of their money. And many of them actually become bankrupt. And actually owe a lot of money as well over time. Um, mainly because that's what brain damage does to you. You become more impulsive, less rational, more illogical, more emotional. Um, and you make a lot of mistakes. Your brain just does not make the right choices. So be smart. Always put your brain first. Always put your longevity, your brain function. You do not want to be someone who suffers over time. You, I mean, Muhammad Ali, I absolutely love him. One of my, In terms of my sporting heroes, my biggest sporting hero. Talk about someone who is so talented, so poetic. Not just poetic in terms of his poetry, but also his movement. Being miles ahead of the competition of the time. Someone, an absolute genius. His foot movement, his... His ability to get in people's brains, to wind them up. He's, he's he absolutely star. Someone who stood up for what he believed in. Someone who went to prison for unjust reasons. During his prime years as a boxer. Who came out and won the heavyweight title again afterwards. Without much training needed. That's how sensational he was as a boxer. Truly the greatest of all times. And I'm a massive Mike Tyson fan. You do not want brain damage because he's a fighter who fought too deep into his boxing career, into his 40s. And that's when he sustained most of his brain damage. It was unnecessary. He should have pulled himself back. But anyway, that's a different story. Let's continue. Uh, we want to avoid excessive stress. Yes, stress harms 
all, all the examples I'm giving you now, physical brain damage does it as well. But stress, especially excessive stress, chronic stress, um, actually harms and kills your brain cells. That's right. The more stressed out you are, the less intelligent you become over time. It kills your brain cells. Not only does that kill your brain cells, but a poor quality diet, an eating program high in refined processed foods, high glycemic index foods such as sweets, chocolates, cakes, pastries, breads, uh, sugary cereals, uh, all yeah, you know, you know the list. I don't have to patronise anyone here. These kind of foods and drinks, for that matter. Even fruit juices um, are excessively high in sugars. They might give you an energy boost in the very, very short term. <clears throat> but over the long term, uh, it leads to chronic inflammation. Um, it leads to your body not functioning well. So many free radicals pervading your entire body insidiously leading to all kinds of diseases, ailments, problems, um, and so on and so forth. Addictions, negative addictions, like I said, drugs, but also other addictions such as um, OCD, uh, smoking, alcohol, um, conflict, the, the love and the need for drama, uh, ne negative addictions, being egotistical, narcissistic, narcissistic should i say all of these addictions are incredibly harmful to ourselves in many different ways poor sleep whoa talk about ruining your brain function in fact just one night's sleep one night of less than six hours sleep can reduce your productivity that following day by up to 30 percent that's right pretty much a third of your ability your aptitudes are compromised by sleeping fewer than six hours just one night. Not only that, but not sleeping well also prevents us from transferring our short-term knowledge into long-term memory. That's why you are less likely to retain information when you sleep poorly. It also negatively affects... <clears throat> Your ability to be creative, original in your ideas and notions, okay? So sleep does wonders for you, our creativity, our thinking, our long-term memory, our productivity. Also for fat loss, keeping our hormones in check. Um, sleep is crucial for uh, enabling your mind, your body, your heart to work effectively and at its best. Poor quality relationships as well. Poor quality relationships lead to higher stress, probably worse choices for your eating, more anxiety, imbalance in your neurotransmitters, like I said previously, serotonin, glutamate, uh, dopamine, and so on and so forth. It throws those neurotransmitters out of whack, out of balance. You know, we have over 100 neurotransmitters in our minds and bodies. Um, we want them to function optimally and appropriately. We want them to be balanced. And having supportive, trusting, loving relationships really does enable your brain to function better. And lastly, avoiding too much isolation. Even if you, like, listen, I'm a big fan of in, uh, being introverted. I work very hard to have a balance between being introverted and extroverted. Um... I'm very much an introvert as well. I love uh, studying, learning, reading. I love being self-reflective, meditating, taking time to myself as well. Um, but too much isolation uh, ruins your relationships, makes you feel disconnected to the, your world, your outer world. Um, and this can have all kinds of repercussions for your brain function. Now, if you like this kind of material, want to know more, check out my website at www.alexgem.com. Simply click where it says join PHS today. Enter your credit card details and you'll gain instant access to my elite course, taking you from wherever you are now 
to where you want to be in your life. We're going to help you to achieve your maximum potential. I offer a 30 day money back guarantee. Get your hands on it immediately. And I can't wait to work with you. Get my book on Amazon, guys The Art of Power, Happiness, Success. I'll see you soon. Take care.